so today we are going to go through uh, how to determine uh, functionalities of networks or their capabilities and we are also going to look at uh, the nature uh, of the uh, LP solution um, how we read it how we interpret it and how we use it so the outline is uh, simple we uh, 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 talk a little bit about the, all the functionalities of a network. There are many things we can study uh, when it comes to a network function. We can study them singly or we can study them in combination. So you can have objective functions that just calculate one objective or you can combine them. So uh, uh, as in other parts of these lectures, we uh, talk about that core model of E. coli and I'll introduce you maybe a little more to its origin here. Uh, the reactions that it's comprised of <coughs> are collectively called the fueling reactions in the uh, older uh, literature. Then we look at a couple of uh, specific optimal solutions and how to understand them. Um, one of the favorite ones is to calculate the ATP production from a substrate. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, redox production uh, from a substrate. We'll talk about the uh, synthesis of these uh, key biosynthetic precursors, and there are 12 of them, and uh, those are the precursors that the fueling reactions uh, produce. And at the end, we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, um, capacity determination of a network as a way to functionally test and debug it as it's being uh, reconstructed. All right, so uh, what to explore? So here is a, an image uh, from one of the uh, um, classical books that uh, Fred Neithart put together. Uh, they originated from that uh, two-volume set that I think we um, were introduced to earlier. Um, I think um, the last version of those books came out in the mid to late 80s, and I think it's been online ever since then. And uh, he wrote a couple of textbooks on microbiology as a result of that. And the books are organized around this schema here. First is to look at the set of what are called the fueling reactions. So these are kind of the catabolic capability of, uh, capabilities of an organism, um, what it can use and, and uh, how it produces its resources. Then there are the biosynthetic uh, reactions or uh, what's called anabolism in uh, many books. And uh, once you have all the precursors for uh, macromolecular synthesis, like amino acids, uh, you polymerize them uh, uh, through translation in that case to protein. And then once you have a bunch of the proteins, you have to assemble the different uh, cellular uh, components. So as you have seen in uh, the earlier lectures here, we basically have stoichiometrically based network models of all these processes now. And you can load them into different uh, computational uh, frameworks and you can interrogate their properties. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to stay with the simplest case of all, which are the fueling reactions. And a simple version of these fueling reactions is that the core E. coli model that we've been talking about is um, uh, comprised of the basic uh, energy uh, yielding pathways in E. coli that can make ATP, NADH, NADPH, uh, also FAD uh, and a couple other uh, redox uh, carrying molecules. So this is a familiar map by now. <clears throat> so we're going to study its properties now. So the first um, property I'm going to look at is the ability to make ATP from a given substrate. So we're going to provide this network with a substrate, and we're going to detail glucose, but look at some others also. Um, and then we ask the network to make as much energy from that substrate as possible. And this is basically equivalent uh, to calculating the ATP yield <coughs> on a substrate. This is not something that a, a cell will do singly or just by itself. It's doing many functions at the same time. Uh, nevertheless, it's useful to do this kind of capacity determination of a network, as we'll see. So in this slide, we show the objective function that we're going to introduce, and it's simply the hydrolysis rate of ATP. So it's an artificial reaction that we're going to call a demand reaction on ATP, and it just takes ATP and hydrolyzes it. And it's a proxy for a summation of any ATP uh, yielding processes that you might want to study later on. 
And you notice it's an elementally balanced reaction. It generates the proton, it generates the phosphate, inorganic phosphate group. Okay, so that's the objective uh, function we're going to be looking at. <clears throat> so this is often the way we would uh, like to visualize a solution. I have uh, what's called the flux map here, which is the input of glucose in this case. And we just normalize it. There are no units. We just put that input to one in whatever units you would like. And then we study the solution. And these node maps shown to the right are often very useful uh, for interpreting a solution and understanding it. And there are three compounds shown in here that are the key in these calculations. It's the node of ATP itself. And there is a node map on the internal proton and the external proton. And it turns out that the proton trafficking across the membrane uh, is the constraining process here. It's the, uh, it's the process that has the dominant uh, constraints in it. So the node map there uh, on ATP has a demand function in it. And I'm showing it also on the network map. It's, it's right next to the ATP synthase. Just hydrolysis basically the ATP that's made by the ATP synthase right away. And the node map there shows you um, the uh, rates, uh, the reactions that lead to the production of ATP and the rates that consume it. And the uh, demand function I put down there has a value of uh, 17 and a half. So uh, the linear programming um, solution uh, or the LP solution uh, tells me that there are 17 and a half ATP molecules that can be produced by this network for every glucose imported. All right, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, more about this. So what does this optimal solution look like? Normally we're only interested, um, well, I should say to a first approximation, we're only interested in the value of the objective. But sometimes we want to look at the whole solution. <clears throat> so this is what the whole solution looks like uh, for um, this optimization problem. And hopefully when the tape is produced, we can zoom in on these numbers because this is a little detailed. So what we have here in the first uh, three columns uh, are the flux values. And we have the reduced cost behind them. And there's zero in a lot of those. And then in the last two columns, we have the uh, uh, compounds, so the nodes in the network, and we have the uh, shadow prices associated with them shown as well. So that's, those are the details of the solution. Reading this particular table is not that important, but this is what the solution looks like, and we take numbers out of these tables uh, to study uh, the characteristic of this optimal solution. So here are some of the things that I picked out of this table that are of interest. So first, there uh, of the 17 and a half ATPs that are produced here maximally, four of them are made by substrate level phosphorylation, and 13 and a half are made by oxidative phosphorylation. And the production of ATP by oxidative phosphorylation happens through the ATP synthase. Now, if you look at the uh, <clears throat> node map to the left, uh, you will see uh, all the uh, production reactions for it. There will be the ATP synthase. There will be two ATP made by phosphoglycerate kinase, which is in the middle of ATP. And there is one uh, that is made by uh, pyruvate kinase. And there are two made in the TCA cycle. Uh, there is one step in the TCA cycle that makes ATP or GTP by uh, uh, um, substrate level phosphorylation. The, the main customer for the ATP here uh, is the uh, demand reaction, but you also see that pyruvate kinase makes it, that it makes one of them. Uh, it consumes one. Now remember that in enterobacteria, glucose is imported by the PTS system, and there's no hexokinase. There's no initial phosphorylation of glucose in enterobacteria by ATP. But it uses PEP to phosphorylate glucose on entry. So that's why pyruvate kinase only makes one here instead of the normal two, because one of those two is used to import the glucose, and there is only one used in the uh, phosphofructokinase to do the second phosphorylation. So that's the balance <coughs> on ATP. Nothing really surprising there, but it's good to look at the numbers and, and get a little more insight into the map. The PO ratio in this model is uh, uh, five-fourths which would be, what is that, 
So for every pair of electrons that goes down the uh, ETS in, uh, in this network, there are five uh, protons pumped out, and there are four protons used by the ATP uh, synthesis to make every ATP molecule. So these are the numbers, the best numbers we can get for uh, E. coli. The PO ratio is not fixed, it does change. Uh, some people use uh, uh, four thirds or 1.33, but I think when you look at it uh, very carefully, everything that's known about the biochemistry here, five fourths is probably the better number for uh, uh, fully uh, aerobic uh, metabolism of glucose. So it turns out, when you look at the solution carefully, that the uh, <clears throat> proton balancing across the uh, membrane is what determines the ATP yield. And we'll show some of uh, uh, the support for that in subsequent slides. But if you look carefully at the solution, that's what it is. There are four protons to make one ATP here. So the shadow price uh, for the internal proton turns out to be minus a uh, quarter. So for one ATP, it's minus. Uh, one then. Uh, okay, so here's the table again uh, of the uh, of the solution, and I put red ovals around some of the things in here that are of particular interest that I want to examine uh, uh, further, and I put them together into text here on this slide. Um, <clears throat> so first uh, thing that you see in here is that the shadow prices on all the intermediates give their ATP value. So in other words, I can read out of the table immediately what the succinate, uh, 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 what the ATP yield on succinate as a uh, uh, substrate would be. Because if I add succinate to the solution, I know what the shadow price is. And I can do that for every single uh, uh, metabolite in there. So for succinate in particular, if I look at the shadow price for it, <clears throat> the uh, cytoplasmic shadow price is 8.75, but the external shadow price is 8.25. Now, why is that a difference? Why is the internal substrate more valuable than the external substrate? Well, it turns out it takes two protons as a symporter that uses two protons to get it in. So it is energetically more valuable on the inside than the outside because you've added two uh, translocated protons to the energy budget of the substrate. And this is a surprise to many that when you start looking at uh, the ATP yields, or NADH yields, people often look just straight at the stoichiometer of the pathway, but they forget that if they look at the balanced network map, you have to move things around, and that may cost things or actually generate energy for you in some cases. And I have a historical example of that later on. Uh, water is made in this solution. Uh, we don't make a lot of power density here, but uh, this is a useful number to have. A uh, cell is a cubic micron, as we talked about. <clears throat> so the, pr the energy production of a cell is about half a picowatt <laughs> or less. So it's a <laughs> um, small power source there that drives the cell, but it's enough to make it uh, grow at a healthy clip. Now, uh, the yield number that we calculate very often surprises people because we are taught in the standard textbooks of Stryer and Leninger and so forth, that the uh, ATP yield on glucose is 38, 36 uh, in the ETS, and 2 by substrate level phosphorylation in uh, glycolysis. But that assumes a PO ratio of 3 in the uh, human mitochondria and no cost of any transport. And this is, of course, not what really happens. The PO ratio for the human mitochondria is higher than that for E. coli. The, the enzymes are more sophisticated than more energy. Uh, um, conserving. But uh, that number of 38 is a theoretical maximum under all sorts of assumptions. The actual PO ratios that you measure typically are much lower. Okay, so here is a little clipping from, um, uh, that I guess we can't read well, uh, from the um, uh, original paper on the yeast. Uh, genome scale uh, model of its metabolism. This was the first compartmentalized model that included uh, uh, mitochondria as a separate compartment. And the literature up until that point had described the discrepancy between the theoretical calculation of ATP yields and the experimentally measured ones based on uh, membrane leakage. That when you charge the uh, membrane in the uh, mitochondria, uh, it would leak some of the protons. 
But when the solution is calculated for the whole network, including the transporters and everything, the solution that comes out matches uh, quantitatively the measured value. So this uh, was an interesting early result from a genome scale model. So you don't have to, you know, you, since you balance the whole network, I, I guess you get a uh, better uh, accounting of uh, the metabolic state. Okay, so that's an example of uh, 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 optimizing ATP yield on one substrate. Now, once you have a um, network uh, that you're working with, there may be many substrates. And these here are all the substrates that that core E. coli model can um, utilize. And you can just repeat this calculation over and over again, and you can calculate all the uh, ATP yields as shown. But what I also showed you is you can read this all out of the shadow prices of a single opt, uh, opt, uh, optimal solution. Here we calculate them both for uh, aerobic and anaerobic growth conditions. So the column to the far right is for anaerobic growth, and you can see zero in many cases there. Um, the model predicts no ATP, being uh, uh, that this network has, doesn't have the ability to produce ATP from these substrates anaerobically. This includes things like ethanol and acetate that we know that E. coli cannot grow on anaerobically. Okay, uh, sometimes the yields, the ATP yields, are identical on two substrates that seem quite different. So lactate is uh, the end product of glycolysis, but uh, uh, E. coli can metabolize it. Malate is an intermediate in uh, the TCA cycle and is a four carbon molecule. Uh, like that, there's a three carbon molecule. But the ATP yields on these two, of these two substrates is identical both aerobically and anaerobically. And you can actually uh, look at the flux maps uh, for these. Uh, so the aerobic on top, anaerobic on bottom, uh, lactate and malate in the two different columns. And the two arrows there show the different inputs into metabolism. And you can actually see that there are just a couple of reactions that are uh, different in between those. Um, and uh, that lead to uh, this result that the ATP, the net ATP yield on these two very different substrates is, is actually the same. So these are the sort of things you learn when you start probing the properties of a network. This is not often obvious a priori by just looking at the biochemistry uh, itself. Okay, so I have a couple of slides here doing the same thing for um, <clears throat> the production of redox potential. So this is done uh, in the uh, same way as um, uh, the calculations for ATP yields. So we put in our demand reaction there, which is stripping the uh, charged form of the carrier of the electrons. And we state that as the objective function, and then we do the calculations. So we're going to look less at the details uh, in this case, but I show here the network map, which has the solution, and there is the objective function. And I show uh, four node maps in this case, uh, the protons inside and outside, ATP, and then the cofactor of interest here, which is NADH. And we see there, there are five reactions producing it. And then I have this uh, demand flux on there that utilizes it. And the uh, uh, optimal solution here is 10. So remember, glucose has uh, six carbons. Each one of them can give two electrons. So if you just look at uh, just the stoichiometry of the pathway, you would expect that optimal solution to be 12, not 10, the way it is calculated here. Well, if you now, um, so I'm emphasizing this because this is systems biology, uh, if you look at the actual solution, we see that the ATP yield is limited by a proton balancing. Uh, and what happens is that you make protons uh, uh, when you're doing this by the uh, demand function that are not all reconsumed by the reactions that lead to it. So you have an excess number of protons made inside when you, when you do this optimization, and you have to pump them out. And, this, and the model here pumps it out by running the ATP synthase in the reverse direction. That, of course, costs ATP. So you can't get all the um, um, uh, redox potential of glucose into the form of NADH because you have to pump the protons out and balance the map. So it's kind of stoichiometrically uh, an ATP uh, limited. So you have to use the, uh, the TCA cycle uh, 
uh, and the ETS and a little odd way to do this. Now you can also now, you can alleviate that constraint. So this is the dominant constraint. Remember we talked about dominant and redundant constraints. We can make this constraint redundant by simply artificially adding an ATP input into the ATP node by some process that generates ATP. And if I do that, if I just add this artificial uh, supplementation of ATP from maybe some other process you might be considering, and you recalculate the solution, now you get 12, which is what you would have expected to. So this uh, is put into the notes here, is uh, it put into this uh, uh, lecture just to illustrate that when you start looking at the system, there are all these other uh, issues that show up that you have to understand and deal with simultaneously. Nothing happens in the cell in isolation. There are always processes that couple to what you're trying to do that can have uh, an adverse effect on, on an optimal value of uh, an objective function, like in this case, because of those additional constraints. Okay, so that's the lesson here, but if you um, artificially alleviate that ATP constraint, you get maybe what you might have expected. So here's a little table that you might have prepared if you're characterizing a network and its ability to make cofactors, uh, and in the, or, or charge cofactors, I should say. So here's a summary of results uh, uh, using this core uh, E. coli uh, metabolic network to produce ATP, NADH, and NADPH, either aerobically or, or anaerobically. So the yields are given there. And now we looked at uh, the details of a couple of these solutions. The uh, second column there shows the use of the pentose pathway shunt, which is a little unusual in some of these solutions, so that's highlighted there. Then I had the ATP shadow price, so it happens to be zero for the production of ATP, because you, even if you, if you supply ATP there, you can't do anything with it, because when it's hydrolysis, it generates a proton, and that solution is constrained by proton balancing. Uh, the production of these two other cofactors is constrained by energy by the uh, uh, reasons that I just gave. That is based on uh, network stoichiometry. And I'll say more about network stoichiometric constraints uh, in a few minutes. So this is a table you might be preparing when you're characterizing a new network you put together. Could, of course, be much more complicated than that because you might be considering many more cofactors than these three. And potentially more uh, contexts contexts or environmental conditions that just uh, plus minus oxygen. All right, so let me uh, talk a little bit about then computing the yields on these biosynthetic precursors. This is normally a prelude to simulating growth. So growth will be a combination of these 12 precursors. So the uh, growth objective is really comprised of multiple objectives that you can look at individually because the growth objective is a summation of these, uh, the need for these 12 biosynthetic precursors plus the uh, three cofactors uh, that I just uh, uh, told you about. So um, I think we mentioned this before, you can calculate growth requirements on a genome scale by looking straight at the amino acid and the nucleotide requirements and so forth. Or you can um, take this uh, baby step towards that by just looking at the ability of the fueling reactions to make these biosynthetic uh, cofactors, uh, biosynthetic precursors, and there are 12 of them. And this table here shows the 12 of them. So that's uh, phosphoglycerate, uh, phospholinopyruvate, pyruvate, oxaloacetate, and so forth. Uh, the second column shows the yield on them on glucose. So the first three molecules in there are three carbon compounds. Glucose uh, is six, so you get 100% yield. You can actually make two of these molecules from every glucose. Uh, there is no ATP constraint on that. Um, so then we look at some of these phosphoglycerates, like, uh, for, uh, as you say, uh, phosphorylated metabolites. The phospho these are mostly sugars. Uh, so glucose 6-phosphate, fructose 6-phosphate, uh, ribose 5-phosphate, and so forth. And you see the yield of them is less than 100%. They have a phosphate group on them. There's a high-energy phosphate group. So you have to burn a part of the substrate fully to CO2 and ATP uh, to uh, generate that high-energy uh, bond that is then kept on the uh, precursor, uh, uh, on the biosynthetic precursor. So 
like uh, you have, what is that, 89% of glucose 6-phosphate, you have to burn almost 11% of it to make that ATP so that you can make that precursor. And so therefore, the shadow price for all of these is positive. This is constraint, uh, this objective is constrained by ATP availability or energy. Now, there are a couple of numbers in here that are interesting, like succinyl-CoA has over 100% yield, and you see also acetyl-CoA is 133% yield. It's four-thirds, basically. So why do you think that's the case? Well, the reason for that is this is more than 100% conversion, is that the model, when it was set up to do these calculations, did not sh uh, shut off the CO2 input. So it actually input, it imports the CO2 and fixes it in this process. So it takes in glucose and CO2 and makes these particular biosynthetic precursors at the over 100% carbon yield relative to you know, glucose, if you calculated it that way. You can, of course, repeat these calculations uh, easily by shutting that uh, input off. Couple of more uh, exa uh, couple of more uh, compounds I want to talk about here: the uh, second and third last line, the acetyl CoA and alpha ketoglutarate. You see, in that case, the uh, yields are below 100 percent, 66 percent, and what is that, 83 and a third percent. You can't get to these compounds in the network from glucose without going through a decarboxylation step. So to make them, you have to go through a decarboxylation step and lose uh, CO2 and therefore carbon. The shadow price for ATP is zero, so this is not energy limited, but it's limited by, reaction, by the structure of the reaction network or its stoichiometry. Okay, so those are interesting considerations to look at uh, uh, the constraints on uh, meeting these objectives. Here they are for anaerobic growth, much worse, of course, uh, uh, much lower, um, and I'm not going to take the time to walk through this table, other than to say that when oxygen is not available, everything changes. So that whole picture changes when it uh, don't make uh, uh, oxygen available. All right, so those are some examples of querying a network. Its ability to make ATP, redox equivalents, biosynthetic precursors, uh, uh, and so forth. We look at the shadow prices, we look at the, uh, the governing constraints, uh, we can see uh, uh, systems considerations come up, uh, and so forth. So those are some of the issues you start running into when you, when you start looking at specific objectives, specific networks, specific environments. Um, and it often uh, requires you to look very carefully at the solution, either in terms of a flux map, a node map, sh uh, shadow prices, reduced costs, and so forth. Now let's talk a little bit about a more practical, as opposed to fundamental way um, of using um, um, uh, computations like I, I just showed. So we were looking at fundamental network properties, now we're going to look at debugging <coughs> uh, uses of them. So here is a set of tests that one can run once you reconstructed the network. And we are now talking about a big network that you're trying to uh, debug and look at. <clears throat> and these are tests that Ines Thiele formalized here uh, some years ago. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll zoom in on the, the text here during uh, the production of the video. But you ask things like, um, you know, you want to make sure things are mass and charge balanced. Do you need any gap filling? We talked about that for the lysine biosynthetic pathway in E. coli early on. Uh, you want to see if there are any internal loops uh, in here you have to shut off uh, and so forth. So these are just a bunch of tests that make sure that your reconstructed network is functioning properly. And I'll show some of these in particular. We mentioned before that Recon 1, when it was built, it was built to match 288 uh, tests like that. So some of them are very simple, like the one shown in here. This is a simple pathway that produces melatonin from tryptophan. It has four steps in it. So when you build Recon 1 and you pull on melatonin, uh, with tryptophan as an input, you have to get melatonin. Then you can make a more stringent test, say, well, uh, fructose should be able to make tryptophan, so you give fructose as an input, and you should be able to pull melatonin off, and you should be able to balance the network. And you see that uh, little screenshot there on top? That's a table of, of uh, I guess, six of these uh, test functions. 
One of them is serotonin, which actually is an intermediate in this pathway. This pathway produces actually three compounds that are, are active uh, uh, on the functions of the brain. Serotonin, uh, melatonin, and 5-hydroxytryptophan, the first intermediate. I think there is also one of these tests shown on here is a degradation of tryptophan to acetyl-CoA. That's something that's active uh, in, um, in uh, human metabolism, so you should be able to feed the tryptophan and pull out the acetyl-CoA. And that, the, your network should pass that functional test. And so forth. So you will have a file with all these functional tests. Here are you know, maybe 50 or so of them, of those 288. And every time you're um, building Recon 1 and changing something, you should have a script that will run those 288 tests and score them every time you're changing something. You may change something and lose a functionality, and it's not obvious why, for instance. So it's kind of, in a way, like you know, building a new version of a software, you're always testing, making sure it's doing the same thing correctly uh, as the previous versions. Now, when validation fails, uh, you have to gap fill, and there is a whole lecture on that later on. So an algorithm called Smiley that we may have mentioned was the first one of these algorithms. <clears throat> then there's a suite of them there called gap find, gap fill, grow match, uh, object find. These are uh, uh, a suite of algorithms developed by uh, Costas Maranis' lab at Penn State University that has made uh, this kind of testing uh, easier to do and uh, more sophisticated. You can, uh, run these tests uh, to, to debug a network. All right, so let's summarize um, uh, this uh, lecture. Uh, so we are uh, just talking about the issues that arise when you are testing the capability of, of a network. We have not talked about in here calculating physiologically meaningful objective functions, for instance. We're just putting in objective functions to test the properties of our network and to characterize it. And this is very easy to do using linear programming, just like I've been demonstrating. Objective functions are easy to formulate and represent certain uh, properties of interest, like making melatonin, for instance. The shadow prices and reduced costs are very useful in interpreting the solution, figuring out the governing constraints, figuring out why the yields may not be 100% carbon yields as you expected, or why the ATP yields are lower than you thought. Uh, and so forth, and that often takes you down the path of looking at the uh, network as a whole and looking at systemic constraints. The primary uh, energy carrying, uh, retos carrying cofactors in the cell are ATP and NADH. So that's often what you look at in the beginning just to make sure that uh, uh, these work right. Sometimes you can you might try to shut off all the carbon inputs into a network and see if you can make ATP or NADH. And sometimes they can, and then there's something wrong. Most, most of the time that's due to uh, incorporation of elementally imbalanced uh, reactions, for instance. So you can get something from nothing, in other words. So that's another test that we didn't mention in here uh, um, that uh, one should probably run. The properties of growth on various substrates is easily uh, studied. Um, you look at uh, the pros and cons of those. Um, the ability to make these 12 key biosynthetic uh, precursors by a network is often a, a prelude to study growth because the growth function is just on a, pulling on all of those biosynthetic precursors at the same time. And finally, um, <coughs> um, uh, exploration like this uh, is often a way to uh, uh, validate the capabilities of a network. So you can state uh, quickly a number of metabolic capabilities that your target organism is known to have and have a suite of these um, uh, tests that you run as you're building a network. So that is the end of this lecture.